So YouTube has been asking me in my comments to do an interview with you. <laughs> People will come to my channel and watch my videos. And I think I posted the, the interview that you did with me on my channel and it's on your channel. Yeah. So now people will come to my comments and say, when are you going to interview Michael Zuber? <laughs> So you're gaining, oh, that's very nice. So you're gaining popularity very quickly. And I woke up this morning and was you. You have to get a one rental at a time T-shirt. I love your hat, by oh, the way. Thank you. But you, you got to get T-shirts. I woke up this morning. I have no purple T-shirts. I was like, all I want to wear is something purple. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will get you one. No problem. <laughs> to go with the whole theme, and I was like, he's got to get some T-shirts. So definitely, nice. that's the next step for you. Um, so I think the reason people connect us is because we're, you're definitely one of my favorite people. Anyone that oh. comes to my channel knows that because you're super down to earth. And that's just so, I feel like it's so hard to find in this mm -hmm. industry. So to start, for those of you that have not been to your channel, first, tell those that haven't been what your channel is so they can join everyone else in like commenting on both of our stuff. Yes. And then two, if you can just give a little introduction of yourself, that would be great. Absolutely. So my, uh, my YouTube channel, pretty much everything I do is one rental at a time, whether it's the book on Amazon or on Audible, whether it's Instagram, uh, and of course, one rental at a time.com. Everything is that. That's my brand. And, and really, why is that? Well, I spent 15 years building a portfolio while working full time of simple little cash flow rental properties. And I think people are connecting you and I because we both had day jobs, we both had careers. Mm -hmm. And you know, we had we had some success diving in. We both didn't know anything at the beginning. I mean, the things that we both admit when we started is comical now. I mean, we look at it and laugh at ourselves. Yeah. So I think people really make that connection. Uh, and we are both just painfully blunt. Right. If you ask me a question, I'm going to answer it. I don't promise you'll like it, but if you don't want the answer, don't ask. Right. So, yes. um, you know, you want to, I mean, I get questions all the time about deals and I can tell they're hoping I give them at least a, a, a half a good, good job. And I'm like, are you kidding me? That's that, that could be the worst deal I've ever seen, yep. <laughs> you know? And, and uh, so I think they, they connect us. So, and of course we're both dog lovers. I can't forget that. Uh, you know, you, yep. you highlight, uh, your puppy who just passed uh, so, so well. So um, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of similarities. Yeah. Yeah. And Michael, what market are you in for people that don't know, or where do you reside? First of all, where's your yeah. home base? So I reside in the Silicon Valley, the Bay area, um, you know, Mountain View is the city. So I'm, I'm like a mile and a half from Google, uh, which most people know, uh, but I don't invest here. It doesn't make sense. So I had to find a market, um, that made sense. And I found Fresno, California, which is a two and a half hour drive one way. Right. So I had to, and I had to pick a market. I never lived in, never been there. Didn't know anyone started with that first house. Yeah. And so when people, that's like a question I get asked a lot because I get a lot of calls from people in California that are like, I cannot invest in California. So you're still in California and you're making it work, but you're not necessarily in your backyard. You're like two and a half hours away. So mm -hmm. when you first started that, because I'm kind of the opposite with that, like my, sure. I invest right in my backyard in my market, except for like larger stuff. So when you first mm -hmm. started looking for a market, what were some red flags and indicators that I can invest where I live, yeah. but this market here is really good. Was it price point? Was it mm -hmm. jobs? What was yeah. it for you? Like where would a newbie start if they're in the same situation? Yeah. So I'll go back to the very beginning and I, I talk about it all the time. I wasted a year believing what you read in books. All the books have always said invest within 30 minutes of your home. Yeah. Right. And if you happen to live where I live, it didn't make sense in 2002 when prices were like 300 grand and now they're like 1.6. So they really don't make sense today. So those books that are written by people that live in the Midwest or they live somewhere else don't appreciate just how stupid California prices could be, right? Specifically yeah. the Bay Area, LA, New York, some very high price markets. So I wasted a year. I always thought there was some magic street. How could all of these published <laughs> authors be wrong, right? They can't be. They, they got to be here. So we, Olivia and I, which is my wife, we spent 52 Sundays in a row driving around. It was a waste of time. Yeah. Uh, I should have I should have been less stupid and maybe after 13 or 14 weeks, 
deciding to go somewhere else. So the next question was, okay, where are we going to go? So I happen to be, have a profession that put me on an airplane three times a week. Okay. And oh, by the way, I'm a horrible flyer. I, I, every little bump freaks me out. And that's, that's with a million miles flow and it still freaks me out. So the last thing I wanted to do was get on a plane to go see real estate because I just wouldn't go. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm terrified of flying, but it is not an enjoyable experience. Yeah. So I wasn't going to do that. So my only option, option was get in a car, right? Where, where could we go? So we pulled out a California map and we just started drawing circles. And for me, um, there were smaller towns that I could have invested in that would have made sense, but it was too risky for me. I'm a very conservative investor. Uh, so Fresno at the time was half a million people, which is right around the, where I wanted to be. I could buy a house for a hundred grand that rented for a thousand or 1100. So it made sense. Um, and that's where I went. And then I never left. I thought about leaving in 06. We, we flew out to Texas. Uh, we did Arizona, uh, Colorado. But, you know, at that time, we, we had about 80 units. And I was like, it is so hard building a team because we had just, you know, the previous six years, we hired and fired like 30 people. Right? Mm. It's like, that's just so much wear and tear. And I'm in, you know, I'm in Chile or I'm in Australia or I'm in Japan and I got to get up at 3 a.m. to talk to some property manager. Because mm -hmm. again, I never managed anything, right? Because I didn't have time. So uh, it, it was very quickly for me, I'm not going to find another market. I'm going to stay close. I'm going to stay in Fresno. I'm going to watch that one market. I'm going to move. I've moved my assets. That's one thing that's really interesting about my story is we were all single family for the first five years. Then we went all multifamily. Then the crash happened. We started buying a uh, single family. Then we bought multifamily again. And then, you know, we sold houses, we sold apartments. So we, we manage our portfolio. We, we add, we trim all the time. Mm -hmm. Good. So when you first started before you bought your first rental property, what did you know about real estate? Nothing, nothing. I'm not, I mean, literally nothing. I grew up in a family where, where money was only talked to spend. We, you know, my parents were both high school graduates. Um, so investing was never a conversation. I was already successful at 25, 26, making six figures. I was the only college graduate in my family. Um, so nothing. Uh, the only thing I knew is I just lost six, uh, lost a hundred grand in the stock market. Mm -hmm. I knew I wasn't Warren Buffett and I knew I couldn't, I knew I couldn't stay in my sales career that I just started for very long because at the time, I was just starting to fly and it was just a horrible experience, but it paid the bills. It paid really well. Yeah. Um, so I knew I needed something that would be the future. And I didn't even, I didn't even think about retiring early until I was five or six years into this journey. Cause for me, it was just, I want a better future. I'm going to buy one and then I'm going to buy one more. And then, that's all it was for me is one at a time. Yeah. So what kicked that off for you? Like, where did you start to learn about it? Was it a class? Was it a book? Uh, so I lost six, I lost six figures in the stock market. That was wake up call. Number one, I walked into a borders bookstore, walked down an investing aisle and I found that purple book yeah. that we all know <laughs> called rich dad, poor dad. Yeah. I read that 10 times in a row. It was the only thing that made travel a little bit easier was reading. Cause I could, I could focus on the book instead of travel. And, um, it changed my mindset. It introduced real estate to me. I was th almost 30 years old and I thought only billionaires owned real estate. I mean, I had no concept. It was, and oh, by the way, I had an MBA. I, I'd, I'd gone to school for a while and I had no idea about rental properties. It's, you know, shame on me totally, but you know, shame on the school system as well. I mean, come on people. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely could do a whole conversation just on the school system. <laughs> <laughs> I yes. know a lot. I know a lot of investors could just on the public school system and what they teach. And I was just talking to an investor friend the other day with the whole uh, virus thing and like keeping his kids out of school or sending his kids back to school. And he's an entrepreneur and he's a phenomenal entrepreneur. And he's like, we've just, they're very young. And he's like, we just made the decision. We're just going to homeschool them. And he already takes them out on the job with him and like teaches them so much business stuff already. I'm like, they're going to learn so oh, yeah. much more from you than they are sitting there, but in a classroom seat. <laughs> like, I think that's a great step for oh, I do too. So, I, yeah. yeah. Those kids are, those kids are going to get a head start that they, uh, they will only appreciate in years to come. Yeah. Yeah. 
So when you first started buying, how fast were you buying? Like how I would say was it was about one every six to nine months, those first couple of years. Because again, we didn't have a lot of money, right? We just lost yeah. a lot. We started this whole one rental at a time with 40 grand. Yeah. Which I, I admit sounds like a lot to some, but is really not. I mean, when you're talking about buying property, that doesn't get you very far. So, nope, it, yeah, it got us three houses. Uh, we, we, we didn't know any better in the beginning. So we put 20% down on the first, got an 80%, mm -hmm. 20% down, 80% first. Uh, then we learned about 80, 10, tens, right? 80% first, 10% second, 10% down. So we bought two more and that's it. Our 40 grand was gone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at the time we were buying, the market was rising. So we did our first cash out refi. Uh, you know, that we, we took that money and we bought two more and we borrowed from our 401ks and we just kept, we just kept moving. And then when prices got up, we did a bunch of 1031 exchanges. Our whole journey, um, you know, starts with 40 grand. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. And so buy, are you still buying today? Yeah, I, I will be buying, uh, probably the rest of my life. Forever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I too. Yeah. I know my market. I know the numbers. I'm not done. I have, I have quarterly goals to add it, you know, at least a thousand bucks in net cash flow to my life. So yeah, um, I'm, I'm practicing what I preach every day. Good. And are you still, so when you buy now, what is your strategy to buy? And are you still financing right away? Are you buying cash or are you using bank financing? I haven't used a bank loan other than commercial, right? Multi, yep. Large multifamily. So I haven't done a residential purchase loan in 12 years, probably. Yeah. So it's either cash because it won't qualify or I have, I have very good private money sources that I've built yeah. up over the years that uh, either will be in it with short term with me or they want to be in long term. Right. Yeah. We have those conversations up front. Uh, so I don't need to go to banks. I've done some, I did some cash out refis right when I retired, which has been about two years ago because I wanted to balance my debt. Right. So what I did is I took all my fourplexes and I, I laddered them up to 60% LTV and then I paid off a ton of houses uh, because I wanted to have that, you know, that oh shit pile, right? Just in case the world ended, I have a bunch of houses that could in theory pay for my existence. So yeah. I look like a genius now, <laughs> you know, we did that two years ago. So uh, yeah, so yeah, I haven't used a bank loan in a long time. And how did you, the private money lenders you have relationships with, how did you build those relationships? How did you uh, find I, them? How did you build I, them? I never asked for them. That's the amazing thing. Uh, yeah. One of the things that both you and I do is we document what we're doing because we, we help first. Yeah. So I've built seven figure private uh, money uh, networks twice in my career. The first time was in 2010, which was the best time to buy ever, probably in my entire life. And at the time, um, at least if YouTube was out there, I didn't know about it yet. So I just created a blog site called wealthbuildingpro.com. I wish I kept it, but it's not there anymore. But I just started documenting everything we did, right? Hey, I just bought this house. I'm calling it the Cracker Jack house. And hey, I just bought this house. It's the, you know, the falling down tree house. Cause I just named them all. Mm -hmm. And I would do befores and afters. And I talked about the numbers. And I mean, I was buying houses for 32 grand, 40 grand that rented for 1200, right? We're not talking 1% or 2%. We're talking 3%. Yeah. That's just how stupid the market got. And I did that for like six months just because I needed something to do, right? I'm just, mm -hmm. I, I lean forward. And the next thing I know, people started reaching out to me in my network, right? My LinkedIn profile and all these other things. It says, hey, you know, I'm scared. I got X amount of dollars in the bank learning less than 1%. Let's talk, right? They didn't want to buy, but they were all great to lend. And I was paying 10% back then. I paid 10% interest only. Mm -hmm. And um, I would have them, they would be, they would 100% finance the deal. 10% interest, right? My mortgage payment would be 400 bucks, but my rent's 12 and I just bought as much as I could. So mm -hmm. uh, the key is to document what you're doing, become knowledgeable. And then the people that know you will find you. I think yeah. the worst thing to do is ask. I know I've never asked for a dime. Yeah. I just document, document, document. Yeah. And give, give, give and educate works yeah. so well. You know, you're just willing to help people. Yep. I, yeah. I, I help without expectation yeah. and it feels, I mean, people that try to do it, it you're not going to get anything for six months. So yes. if you think you can do three videos and you're going to get a hundred grand thrown your way, just stop it. Yeah. I've been on YouTube now for about two years. I have almost 3000 videos in two yeah. years. I average three videos a day. Yeah. So if you want to go document what you're doing, get ready to put in some work. Yeah. Yeah. So when you earlier, you said you were the first person in your family to graduate college. 
correct? Mm -hmm. And you have yes. your MBA. Does your family understand what you do now? Uh, and are they involved at all? Uh, so, um, so, so just to be clear, when I say my family, it's my family. Like my yes. wife, Olivia, she has a degree and all of that. So I want to separate what yep. you mean by family. Yeah. Uh, so my family in the beginning was um, not supportive, right? They, they lived paycheck to paycheck, yeah. um, never really had savings. They saw real estate as nothing but risky. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's just where they were. I would say, and, and we never talked about money or net worth or taxes or anything, but I think by the time we've been doing it for 10 or 12 years, it became obvious where we were. And then they became wildly supportive. <laughs> you know, long after it was probably uh, made sense, but yeah, they, they never got it. And we've still never talked. M money is a, uh, not a concept that I talk with uh, my family because every time it does it, they just want to ask for money. So, gotcha. uh, but my wife, right. She has an advanced degree as well. And we talk about money all the time. So um, yeah. she's, she's a, I wouldn't be here today without my, without Olivia. Yeah. Um, she, she was able to help me balance the workload that comes from raising a family, having a crazy job. And she worked too. Let's, let's give her full credit as well. Mm -hmm. She had a tech job as well. So um, yeah, I wouldn't be here today without her. So uh, yeah, who goes to Olivia. Yeah. And I, it's, I asked that question because I, my family doesn't, I think, understand or know what I do at all. And we don't really talk about it. I have one sister that is a private money lender, um, has a self-directed IRA from an old job. And I mean, the, at the rate I'm growing her self-directed IRA, she loves it. She loves it, but she doesn't, she obviously fully trusts me. But yeah. when the money comes back, she's just like, okay, again, let's yeah. do this. More please. <laughs> again, again, because she's just watching this thing grow so fast compared to what it used to. Yeah. Um, and it's just interesting what you say, like with family and having that support and you're lucky to have your wife to bounce things off of. Cause sometimes not everyone. And I know for newbies, sometimes like I've coached newbies where it's very hard for them to um, separate away from their family and that negativity. Like yeah. I've seen some newbies that have such potential and they kind of just get sucked back into this mm -hmm. negativity and lack of support. And I've also seen newbies that were in that situation and then they've met their significant other and their significant other was the complete opposite of their family. Yes. And then they just totally skyrocketed and then took off. So yeah. you have to make a conscious effort in those situations. Like I love my family like crazy and wouldn't be where I am without obviously their love and support, even though they don't understand what I do. Mm -hmm. But same thing, like we don't have conversations about money. They don't really understand private money lending, stuff like that. We just don't go there in those conversations. So you have to kind of sometimes distance yourself from, from negativity or know mm -hmm. what conversations you can have with people that don't understand and what conversations you can't have. So yeah. I just always like people to know, like not every entrepreneur comes from this family where they like talked about real estate and talked about money. And a lot of, a lot of us have been in situations where family has been um, like either negative or not supportive, or they just don't understand. So you just feel like you don't have anyone to talk to, you know? Yeah. What I will tell you as an entrepreneur or somebody getting started is even if you're lucky enough to have a family that's supportive, I can guarantee you there is somebody in your network, somebody in your top five that you're going to have to remove. Right. I, I really can look at whoever you socialize with, the five people that you socialize with, and I can guarantee I can pick your outcome. Yeah. All right. So I tell a lot of new people is to tell me who your top five, right? Who you spend the most time with. Right. Yeah. Are your buddies out there getting smoking, getting high, playing video games all day long? Well, I know where you're gonna be. Are yeah. you out shopping for Louis Vuitton and you know all this other stuff? Well, I know where you're gonna be. Or are you up at 5 a.m., you know, hustling before your day job? That's what people don't realize, right? I had a day job that took me all over the world, three, at least three different cities a week. When you add travel, I was easily doing 100-hour weeks, and I still found time every mm -hmm. single day to look at my market. I had two jobs, bust my ass during the day to make as much money as I could, and then find deals. That's what I did. I looked every freaking day for 10 years. I look almost every day for 20 years. 
you just hit the nail on the head when you said it, when you said I had two jobs, yeah. people kind of like, I think sometimes think this is some magical thing that's going to happen. And I tell them like, I worked full time. Yeah. And if I had a 30 minute lunch break, I would rather drink, suck down a protein shake and spend yep. the next 25 minutes folding letters and looking for deals than sitting there like talking to other people on my lunch break. And people yeah. would say to me all the time, just come to the cafeteria with me. Just sit with us. Just talk with us. And I'm like, I don't have time. Like I've got nope. stuff I got to do. I got to fold letters. I got to look for houses. I got to do this. I got to do that. Like you're, I tell people you're building a business. You're, yes. you're opening up your life to say, I want a second job. Yes. That's exactly what you're doing. And I think people come in a little doe eyed sometimes and don't understand that. Like it's just going to magically happen yeah. like this without putting in the time and effort and, and, and going through the criticism of it. Like, yeah. it's amazing when you look at your circle, like, um, when you first get started, like people will make fun of you for not watching TV. What do you mean you don't watch TV? What do you mean you don't watch the show? What do you mean you don't have cable? What yeah. do you mean? And I'm like, well, I just don't have time. So like, yeah, exactly. well, I have it. like I'm working. So what are you working on? Why are you buying that house? Even when I retired from my job, they were like, see in six months, yeah. like you got to like block it all out and kind of keep your blinders on, just stay in your lane and keep your head down and nose to the grind for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's how bad do you want it? And, and yeah. again, it, it's, it's, it is, a, it, it's a set of activity you have to do on a consistent basis. It needs to become a habit. It doesn't have to, I mean, if you do buy and hold like I do, you don't, it doesn't have to be a lot of time. I bought everything that we retired on out of the multiple listing service. Everything we added to our portfolio was publicly available to everyone else. Yeah. No direct mail, no wholesalers, no uh, texting. It didn't exist, right? I started yeah. back in 2002. Didn't exist. Yeah. And um, the only reason I did it is because I looked every day. I was willing to call agents and I grew my network. I knew new people. Uh, by the time you get into it, four or five years, more people know you. That's the magic of what you and I do. It's not how many people I know or April knows, but it's how many people know April. Yeah. How many people know Michael? Because yeah. today, greater than 50% of the deals I say yes to come to me directly Yeah. because I communicate. Yeah. Every real estate meetup I go to, my closing slide or second to closing slide is, this is what I'm buying today. <sighs> and here's my number or yeah. here's my email. I'm, I'm telling everybody all the time, I'll help you. But oh, by the way, this is what I'm looking for. And if you find it, call me, call me first. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So when you first started buying, have you always had like property management and agents one. in the area that you buy in? Okay. Yeah. So you had said you've gone through some hiring and firing <sighs> and changeover of your team. So any like big lessons that stand out to you from that as far yeah. as what to look for in a team or what's most important and how to go about finding yeah. that? Because that's huge. The whole uh, bringing paramount. people onto your team. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's First and foremost, the clearest thing, if you're going to follow the one rental at a time story as a property manager, right? So again, remember, I have a full-time job. I could be in any, any country around the world during the week. And, um, you know, we have units and it grew from one to three to 10 to whatever. Um, so I needed, I needed to have a property manager uh, day one. Uh, I can tell you what I have found to be the best is I want the principal of the property manager to be an investor. I don't want, oh, I have a house that I bought or my parents gave me a house or blah, blah, blah. I want them to own units. I want them to own dozens. And I want them to be investing in the business. I want the number of people they employ in that property management arm to be bigger this year than it was two years ago. Yeah. And the one, the one mistake I made two or three times is I went to a, the principal of the property manager was also a real estate broker. And that feels good right? Because they know the vocabulary, this, that, they can be a lead source, all of that. But again, I've been doing this 20 years and I promise you when that real estate broker has a hot market, they're going to go get that commission and they're going to ignore the property management mm, business, right? Gotcha. One, one, one property manager that I know specifically in 2008, 9, and 10 became the biggest short sale broker in Fresno. Mm -hmm. He was making seven figures a year selling short sales. He, he gave a rat's tail about the units he managed. Wow. And I'm like, you know, my report was three or four weeks late. I'm like, I'm out. You clearly yeah. don't. Care. And he didn't care. 
But then when the short sale market blew up, he's like, oh, come back. I'm sorry. I got more money now. I'll, nope, sorry. I'll, yeah. I, I, I won't ever go to a, a pro property manager where the principal is a broker. Yeah. That was, again, that didn't, it just didn't work for me because I, I want to do this for decades. Yeah. My history says two different times when the market gets hot, they will go to the commission and ignore, because property management is the hardest job on the planet as far as I'm concerned. I say the same thing. <laughs> I, you couldn't pay me. I mean, you literally no, couldn't I pay me. Same thing. People tell me all the time, April, open a property management company, start your own property management company. I'm like, no way. <laughs> no way. No chance. Zero chance. Yeah. No, not going to happen. Yeah. And pay them what they're worth. Like I hate when people <laughs> try, and, try and nickel and dime property managers because I'm like, no. you have no idea. You have yeah. no it's idea. It's not about price. Not yeah. about price. Don't Probably. go to the cheapest one. <laughs> yep. For sure, for sure. It's definitely about quality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Totally agree. So when you're, are you, with stuff coming to you now, do you have anyone else that works like for you or with you directly other than your property management mm -hmm. team? And I have no employees and have no interest in having any employees and yeah. have no uh, partnerships, right? Okay. It's just, just Olivia and I. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we've always done our own thing. Um, we certainly stunted our growth by doing that, but we also control everything. So we kind of live yeah. and die by our own decisions and we're okay with that. But yeah, no employees. Um, uh, I managed people when I was in my job and the last thing I want to do is to have employees. I'm about enjoying the rest of my life. Yeah. We spent 50, again, 15 years sacrificing. We enjoyed nothing. We yeah. drove old cars. We didn't go anywhere. We put every dime back into the business. And um, I'm going to enjoy the next 45 years. Um, yeah. And that means no employees. Good. So. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> when you, when uh, I first started, and even now, I find myself saying this now, someone will be like, why don't you buy like whatever it may be, this, these expensive shoes or this expensive that. And I'm like, Cause that stuff doesn't matter to me. Like yeah. different things are important to different people. But in my mind, I relate everything to marketing costs. So ah. I'll be like, Oh, that's a $110 pair of shoes. Okay. $110 that can get me how many letters. And I'm like backtracking <laughs> in my head still to this day. And I nice don't have to be like that, but I'm still like that. But you know, different things important to different people, but same thing. Yeah. There's a lot of sacrifice that goes into like getting to this point where we're at. It's not, instantaneous it's not overnight it's years and years and years and years you know and yeah just, pe pe people need to hear that because yeah. um, again we've been doing i've been doing this 20 years and i remember many many people started around the same time i uh, we did in 2002 they got a little happy-go-lucky in 06 because the market mm -hmm. we were in more than double mm -hmm. right so they were doing cash out refis and buying that seven series bmw and going on that twenty thousand dollar life-changing vacation mm -hmm. Olivia and i like we're not done yet. We're not doing that, right? Because mm -hmm. if you peel off one cash out refi, you're just stunting your growth, right? If you pull it out and you spend it on anything except another rental property, Fasting. you are yeah. stunting your growth. Yeah. And um, yeah, we didn't. I mean, I remember the, one of the most painful memories I ever have is about after 10 or 11 years of doing this, we had just left another housewarming where one of my direct reports, right? So he, he reported to me, Mm -hmm. had an open house, this gorgeous house. And I remember driving home, pulling over because I'm bawling, going, I don't know. I mean, are we doing this the right thing? Because we're still in a condo and this guy's in a house. Yeah. We don't have a backyard, blah, blah, blah. And I just lost it. And Olivia talked me up and said, it, it'll happen. And, you know, fast forward five or six years, you know, I haven't had to work in two years. And, you know, this other gentleman, you know, still has to work to pay his tax bill and all this other stuff. Yeah. So it worked out. But man, I remember that day like it was yesterday. That was horrible. Yeah. 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 It's very the, and it goes back to the, the, it's like a comparison thing too. And I don't think, I don't know if that ever ends. I just feel like it's something you constantly have to rein in and think about what is important to me in my life and am I on the track I want to be on for, for what my goals are and just having your goals in front of you. And yeah. like, do you want that big house or do you want just like a condo and to travel all over? Yeah. Like what, what is it that's important to you? Or is it the big fancy car? But no matter what it is, 
if you don't want to work forever, <laughs> exactly. you've got to make sacrifices now, especially yeah. I feel like when people, you can do it at any age, but I feel like when people are younger, they definitely have like more energy to be bouncing to jobs and yeah. hustling yeah, I, like that. I tell, I mean, I, 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 nothing thrills me more than talking to a 20 or 22 year old. Oh my gosh. I know. I'm like, I'm like, you know what? You could be, you could be financially free by the time you're 26, but let me, let me tell you, you've got to live on ramen noodles for yeah. the next two or three years. And you can't, you can't, you can't do what I did, right? I bought the $50,000 car when I made 30 grand a year. You can't do none of that stuff. Live yeah. with your parents, sock away the money, work, work you know, insanely amount of hours and you could be financially free by 25 to 27. Yeah. Any of you. Yeah. How bad do you want it? And that's yeah. just, just so much fun for me. Yeah. When kids come to me, kids, they're so young, like in their twenties <laughs> and they're like, I'm just trying to find a two unit so I can live in one side, not have to pay rent and rent out the other. And the first thing I say is who taught you that? Who, yeah. who, where'd you learn about that? What book did you read? Who taught you that? Cause I was never, no one ever talked to me no. about that stuff when I was younger. So I was like, I need to know. And then I'm like, go home and thank your parents or like whoever yeah. they say taught them about that. I'm like, go home and thank them for everything yeah. they've done for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an awesome thing. So I, one of the interesting things that I love about you when I first talked to you was we were both talking about how at the end of every year, we're evaluating our portfolio, mm -hmm. which few people talk about, I feel mm. like, and I feel like it's really important. And a mentor of mine during one of my mastermind meetings had said, sometimes we keep doing what we do, we were doing and we stay at a place or keep buying the same things or doing the same things because we're comfortable. And that's mm -hmm. what we know. So we like the comfort but we don't look back or look at the situation to see why are we doing this and is yeah. it still meeting our goals? So at the end of every year, we also evaluate our portfolio and what's, what, are we, what properties are we hating? What is mm -hmm. making us money? What is just kind of like been more of a drain than anything? Yeah. Um, so can you talk about what, a little bit about what your process looks like for that? And what I really like about you is sometimes you're buying multi, sometimes you're buying singles, you're kind of cycling in and out. You really pay attention to key indicators in yeah. the market. So yeah. Yeah. Just, I, think, I think, I think there's a couple of things. So one of the, one of the things, I mean, we always bring whatever we did for a living to our investing. And one of the things I had, you know, in, for 20 years of my career, I had a, a yearly quota commission, right? I was, I was a sales guy. Um, so what that means is every year it changed. So it always forced you to self-evaluate, right? So something I always did is you finish, it's literally, it's an amazing feeling. Uh, let's just use the calendar year, right? December 31st, you close that last big deal. You make a bunch of money because you crushed your number. And then January 1st, you get your new number and you're, everybody's at zero. That's not normal for most people, but I've lived that for so long. I always spend that first week of January going, how can I do 2X whatever number they gave me? Mm -hmm. Whether it was a $3 million number or a $2 billion number, how can I double that? Mm -hmm. And it just, it's a mindset, right? Because they always give you a number that's some portion of what you just did. If you did 2 million, they're going to give you 2.5. You did 2.5, they're going to give you 3.1. But I always was like, no, I don't want to do 3.1. I want to do 6.2. And by going exponential, it, it just forces you to throw away what you did because it won't work and, and start anew. So I brought that to investing. So I do that every year. Um, you know, we're looking at both what we're buying and we look at our current portfolio. We are always considering what to sell. That's a big deal because, right, I'm in the buy and hold space. Mm -hmm. but, you know, that's just the category, right? Because I don't flip and I don't wholesale, right? So I'm buy and hold. But I manage our portfolio, right? We have a triplex, a three-unit building in escrow now to sell because it has underperformed three years in a row. It's still mm -hmm. cash flowed. Mm -hmm. It still put money in our bank, but you know, let's say I wanted a thousand, it's only put 400. So it's not performing to the expected yield that I wanted it to. So I'm mm -hmm. going to take the cash out. I'm going to take the equity out. I'm going to deploy it somewhere else. So the number I use and why I will buy a 20 unit sometimes in a 600 square foot, one bedroom house sometimes is yield. And some people call it cash on cash, but I don't like cash on cash because it assumes some equity like I bought it cheap, so it adds 50 grand. No, I don't consider any of that. Mm -hmm. It's two numbers. If the denominator is how much cash do I have to deploy, right? Do I have a down payment? Do I have closing costs? And do I, what does it take to have it 
be rentable. I call it make ready. So that's the denominator. The numerator is just my expected yearly cash flow once the building is up to my standards, which most of them get raised. And that produces a yield. It's a simple percentage. And I always know my market. Today, it's 6.5%. 2010, it was 15%. Mm -hmm. So I'm always adjusting. I have a spreadsheet. I talk about it all the time. And it goes in there. And I look at, I look at multifamily and houses. And today, multifamily is really expensive. So houses are cheaper. In 2016, 15, apartments were better than houses. So I'm looking all the time across the board and I'm gonna, I will buy what's cheap and sell what's expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've been selling some stuff too recently. So yeah, yeah you should. And I mean, yeah. The market's great for it. And sometimes just your strategy changes and what you want to buy changes and that's, mm -hmm. that's okay. okay. Perfectly yeah. okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think having cash today, as we head into 2021, 2022, it's going to feel good. I have more cash now than I've ever had. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. Cause you know, that's a hot topic. And I yeah. get asked about that all the time. Um, what are your thoughts on where we're going in real estate? Be and you had made a comment earlier about 2010 and how 2010 was awesome. I mean, uh -huh. we, we cleaned up in 2010. Like yeah. I tell people that all the time. I'm like the majority of my portfolio like we still buy and we're selling some stuff, but I'm like the majority of my portfolio was purchased in 2010. Like I tell people that all the time. It was just like, yeah. boom, boom, boom. We were picking up stuff left and right. Do you think we'll see that again? I know no. nobody has a crystal ball. What do you think? Well, there's no chance we see 2010 again. I'll, I'll put it out there and get recorded. There's no chance. <laughs> there's no, well, let's, cause again, let's talk about it. Let's just talk about it logically. What set up 2010? Again, I've been, I was buying before it. So what happened yeah. is, is we had owners and investors buying houses and, and duplexes and everything was residential. That's the big thing that people miss is the 2010 crash for the most part was residential lending. Mm -hmm. What happened is we had liar loans and two and 28s and it was a bad lending environment. The asset that the bad loans were tied to was housing. So when the loan went bad, housing went down. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. What is happening today? None of the, almost none of those loans. A couple of them are starting to come back, but we don't have liar loans. We don't have asset-based loans. We don't have uh, strippers buying three houses in Vegas uh, as rental units and and or restaurant tours or whatever it is. It, it's just a different lending environment, and everybody has fixed rate debt. Everyone, mm -hmm. right? What were they buying in '06? They were buying variable loans because the story was borrow 1.9% and refi in two years because the price will go up. Real estate only goes up. Remember? I remember hearing that. Real estate only goes up. Real estate only goes up. <laughs> so why have a fixed rate loan? It's, a, it's an entirely different world today. What is really happening today is we are going to see big cities collapse mm -hmm. in prices. We are going to have some cities like New York and San Francisco fall in value and it's already happening. And they're going to fall more probably substantially because what this health crisis is teaching us is space is good. Mm -hmm. So no more vertical living, no more $3,000 rent for a shoebox. I want a backyard for my kids. Cause I got to homeschool them. I want, you know, I want a front yard for mom and dad. I want a garage space is good. So we are seeing a rush out. It's exactly opposite of the great depression. The great depression was leave the farms, come to the city. Yeah. This is leave the cities, go to the, you know, not farms, but go to the suburbs yeah. because Zoom calls and I can work from home and all that. Even though we have unemployment that came out today at 10.2 and let's say it goes to 14 or 15, that's still 85% of the people working. They're just going to, we are seeing a huge trend. I believe single family homes go up double digits value wise in most cities because right now the demand outpaces supply. I've been in Fresno 20 years. I had a call with a broker on Tuesday. They're at one month supply of single family homes. Wow. Never. In 06, it was 3.1 months. Just to show you how abnormal today is. Yeah. Prices are going to go up in the suburbs. They'll fall in San Francisco. They'll fall in New York. They'll fall in LA. But I am so glad I own a lot of real estate in Fresno because yeah. we, could, we could see you know, over the course of two or three years, a 25 to 30% rise in value. Uh, and oh, by the way, rents will go up too, because we fundamentally don't, the supply mix is all wrong. Mm -hmm. We have a whole bunch of city buildings, but if the people leave the cities and we have a mismatch of supply and demand. Yeah. 
we're seeing rents go up here. We're not really seeing appraised values go up too much, but we're seeing rents go up a lot. Yeah, rents are gonna, I mean, again, rents are gonna go up, values are gonna go up. All of that is happening. Yeah, I have a little pause on my end. Do you still have me? I do, yeah, you paused for a few seconds. Yeah, yeah, I was a little frozen for a second, sorry. Um, so do you invest in anything else other than real estate or do you just stick to real estate? Um, no, I mean, I have a few ounces of gold or silver that I picked up when I was younger that I've just, yeah. I, I have, I actually have as a paperweight, the kilo of silver. It's a pay, it's nothing more than a paperweight, but no, it's, it's cash, it's cash flow, real estate and cash. Yeah. Uh, and, and the cash is just there so I can take care of real estate when it's there. I, yeah. I don't believe in just diversification. I know one thing and know one thing well. And again, I'm comfortable staying where we are, right? If I have to hit the pause button, that's okay. Right? Yeah. We, we can wait it out. Yeah. 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 Someone said to me, like, invest in what you know, like what you're knowledgeable about, you know? So. Oh, yeah. And again, I started this story by admitting to losing 100 grand in the stock market. I'll, I, I will never own stocks again. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get involved in that either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at all yeah people talk to me about it I'm like i don't know ask somebody yeah, I don't else know. <laughs> so, yeah 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 they, on my channel they come to me all the time now like hey look at my stock it's up blah, blah, blah. i'm like great good for you congratulations yeah i yeah. don't know <laughs> so um you had talked a little bit before and i'm just gonna like kind of wrap up talking about we're both very much go-givers and help mm -hmm. other people a lot and you do some coaching and mm -hmm. someone asked me, someone emailed me the other day and asked me, how would your students describe you? And I said, <laughs> oh, no, brutally honest and direct. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm cool with that. That yeah. could be my performance review right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit about like what you coach on yep. and who your ideal student is and kind of yep. how would your students describe you that you coach? Yeah, so I, I would say, uh, first off, I developed a course that I, I do every day, right? So when I retired, I said yes in the beginning to all the coffee talks and the lunches and all of that. But as you grow in popularity and people really dig in and you write a book that's well received, I, I quickly couldn't say yes to everything, which meant I had to say no to most things because I don't like picking winners mm -hmm. and losers. So I spent months documenting mm -hmm. everything I'd done, and it's called How to Get Started One Rental at a Time. So it smacks you in the face. I'm not, I'm not a fluffy person. I'm like, yeah. step one, do your friggin' homework. Yeah. Focus, look at your market 30 minutes a day, build your spreadsheet. Let's go. And I don't give you, I don't, sh I don't show you my spreadsheet in step, step two. I tell you everything that's in it because I want you to be immersed and know your spreadsheet, how you are learning your market. Step two, we break it down, right? What's in it? And then we start doing the math. And I believe most people overcomplicate real estate. Mm -hmm. I believe you make your money on your buy. I believe in yield. It's the only thing I have. And yield to me is how hard is my cash working. And that's how I can compare an apartment with a house. Is, is, the, heart, is the apartment more? I don't care if it's 20 units. If it produces a 6% return and a house is 8%, I buy the house. Mm -hmm. I don't care if one's 20. And it's eight versus six, people. It's that simple. Uh, and then I talk about building a team and managing that. It, it is. It is everything I do today. And again, like you, I give, and I added onto that a Facebook group just for students that pay. And I added onto that now uh, where we talk every Saturday at 9 a.m. on Facebook. So everything is for them, right? I have a dedicated place for them. It's where I look every day. And uh, I, think my, I think my students would say he's very repetitive. Learn your market, no alligators. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm... I do what I do and I do it very well. And it's because I've been simple and conservative. Yeah. It, you got to keep things simple. I think people way overcomplicate things too, which is yeah. why we also connect so well because yeah. just the whole direct, keep it simple. It's really not, it's a lot of work, but like don't, people overthink and like throw yeah. too many numbers at it and complicate it way too much. Yeah. yeah, there's so many people that want to go 50 directions an inch at a time. And I promise you, you won't get anywhere. Yeah. I'm, yeah. If, if you fall, I mean, go figure out YouTube University for what you want to do, right? Do you want to be a flipper, a wholesaler, run a business, be buy and hold? But once you pick, ignore everything else. Yeah. 
especially yeah. in the beginning. Ooh. Yeah, agree. I call that chasing butterflies. There's just there like too much. And real estate people are always like, this is the greatest. No, this is the greatest. And this is greatest. It's like, I do figure, yeah. out, figure out what works for you and like your lifestyle and your path and the direction you're headed. Yeah. Just to pile onto that. I do the same thing with locations. I get the same question. Okay. I'm going to be a buy and hold investor like you, Michael, but where should I go? Should I go to Huntsville? Should I go to Cleveland? Should I go to Dallas? I'm like, no, you need to <laughs> learn the skill of learning your market. Yeah. Wh whatever market is near you, learn that market. Because if you can learn what, how, what I teach, you can take that skill and take it anywhere you want to go. Yeah. But you can't learn a market by going, I'm going to look at Dallas and Cleveland and Huntsville. Yeah. That's like saying, I'm going to be a flipper, a wholesaler, and an apartment investor. You All won't by get anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you just can't. I mean, because next thing you know, you're going to think, I don't know what the lowest price is. I'm going to guess it's Huntsville. Um, then you're going to suddenly compare Huntsville with Texas, and that doesn't make any sense. The price points are different. The property tax is different. The rents are different. I mean, ah, uh, drives me crazy. Yeah. Learn your market, people. Pick one and go. Yeah. And I, I always tell people, like, my company's called Lazy Girl REI or Lazy Girl Consulting. And people are like, but you're not lazy. I'm like, but I am lazy. Like, I don't, when I first started out, I, I flipped a house. Okay. And then we bought a six unit and then we did some more flipping and then I flipped yeah. for a while. And then when someone suggested I add wholesaling, I'm like, Oh, like, I don't really feel, uh -huh. like, I, I don't feel like I have the capacity to like add that into the mix and learn that. And like, so I was just like, who in my area is really good at wholesaling and then yeah. teams up with them. Like yep. let's team up. Like, yeah, same thing. Just really focus on like what your thing is. I got to tell you that lazy girl thing. When I saw that two years ago, I'm like, I don't see it. I get what you're doing, <laughs> but there's nothing about April that I, I look at and think lazy. So um, yeah, there's nothing lazy about you. Yeah. I just try to leverage other people. I leverage my strengths and then yes. I leverage other people. Like I don't want to be the type of person that buys rentals. So I feel like I have to have a property management company yep. and like no, flip. So I feel like I have to wholesale. Like this mm. is what I'm good at. This is what I want to do everyone can do everything else they're good at. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to give everyone on the, um, on YouTube, a little discount code for your yeah. course. So we'll put that up on the screen and just to wrap up, tell people where they can find out more about you. Mm -hmm. Um, like your YouTube channel, which we'll also post in the comments where they can grab your book and all mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So we'll start with the book. So you can get the book one minute at a time. It's it's actually doing quite well on Amazon and it's Audible. Awesome. It's awesome. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Uh, do one favor though, if you do buy it, you got to leave a five-star review. Uh, we're almost at 300 five-star reviews, which is nice. kind of cool. Yeah, for a self-published guy, that's, that's something to be proud of. Nice. Uh, YouTube is one rental at a time. Uh, you can find the course at the website, one rental at a time. You'll have a link. Yeah. And we're, we are given a $25 discount code just for you. It's April 25. Sweet. Sweet. So yeah, we will. And then um, what's your Instagram account, Michael? One rental at a time. Everything's one rental at a time. Just Google one rental at a time people and follow everything. So yeah. yeah. So cool. I would tell folks to check out a playlist on my channel. I think it's called student reviews. Okay. Right? The, the course, the course is working. It is focused on making you work. If you are going to get the course hoping for an easy button or something of that nature, don't even bother. But if you want to learn a market, learn a skill and buy some property, Let's go. And yeah. I've kept it. I mean, we could, we could sell this thing for a lot more. It's only one ninety nine after so your discount code. It's one seventy four. Yeah. It's because I don't need the money. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm comfortable where I'm at and I'm just going to help as many people up the ladder as I can. That's, that's what we're going to awesome. do the rest of our life. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully this satisfies YouTube for a little, I've actually never been to California, but I'm coming to California this winter. So ah, I'm, where? I'm, um, we're probably gonna, I want to go explore all of California. Oh, We've never right. seen it. So we're going to drive the coast and go to a whole bunch of different areas. So maybe we'll have to do like a second round of interviews, like in person or something. Yeah. I, <laughs> one of the places you're probably going to go is 17 mile drive. Well, let me just tell you, you need to go to the 17 mile drive in Carmel. It's okay. kind of right in the middle. It's a gorgeous drive and it's, it's two hours. I mean, we love going there. We'll take you to lunch at Roy's as a restaurant there. Cool. My wife and I, you'll meet Olivia. It, it, uh, let's, let's plan on that. Cool. We will. So I'll see you in California. So you got it. Thanks, <laughs> thank you, Mike.